Good morning and welcome to Trinity Alliance Church. We're so glad that you've come to worship with us today. We want to welcome you on live stream and in person. And we just want to um, draw your attention first off to our website, TA Church. There'll be more announcements later, but um, that's where you can find what's what and what's happening here. But for now, I'd like you just to spend a few minutes quieting your soul. We come today with the table of mercy in front of us in a celebration of the gift that we have in salvation. So I ask that you just take a moment to pause. Lay down whatever you came in here with. I look around and just the ones that I know, there's grief, there's physical healing needed, there's financial woes, there's stress. And that's just what I can see. Lay it down, the foot of the cross. Just use this time to reflect and confess and prepare yourself for a meal with your king. we enter into your throne room with praise and thanksgiving. We come and we adore you. We lift you high. 
We praise you for the freedoms that you give us. The breath in our lungs. The salvation that you so freely gave. Lord, we love you. We are so grateful. And we're humbled and awed by how much you love us. Please accept our praise and our worship. Put us in the posture of surrendering to you so that you alone are the focus today, God. I pray that when we look across this room, we don't see just people. We see brothers and sisters surrounded by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Overwhelm. Cover our sins. We confess them. We lay them down. And we stand in awe, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you. We worship you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Won't you stand? Even at home, we're going to be reading 1 Corinthians 13. It's a very familiar passage. If you have a Bible, please find it. If not, just listen and let the words of the, the Lord wash over you. And this is what it says. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of, my, of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Tasted and seen of 
the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit
Holy Spirit. Bring light to the dark. 
will be when he returns and all the earth will shout everything that has breath will declare holy
moments right where you are, worshiping your God, giving him praise. God, our Father, you alone are worthy of our praise. We come with one thought in our minds today, God. We stand unified, praising the name of Jesus, lifting you high. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Oh, God, we worship you. All other things fade away, but you, but you. Oh, Lord, thank you. You are worthy of it all. From you come every gift, and back to you we shall return if we belong to you, God. So we stop and we thank you 
We cry out in the overflow of what you have poured into your children, God. We stand in joy celebrating the gift that you gave us that cost you so much. We can't even fathom. Lord, we confess that sometimes we don't make time. We don't pause. God, forgive your children, please. We want to come home. And you said, come. My children, my arms are open. My forgiveness is eternal. you for washing this sinner clean and allowing me to stand in your presence and testify to the goodness of a good God who loves me and created me. Oh, Lord, I'm overwhelmed by the gift. So as we stand in this room, crying out to you, our God, you are worthy of it all. It's your breath in our lungs. You alone are the one we welcome here, God. Line us up with where you are. Oh, God, teach us to follow hard after you, chasing after you. Keep us from temptation. And remind us that forgiveness is ours. You bought it by the precious blood of your Son. Oh, Lord, we receive it today. Thank you. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing it again. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Kind of changing things up, I'm going to be giving the announcements during this time. There's just a couple of things I want you to mark your calendars for. Um, Sunday night, February 27th, there will be a worship night here at 6.45 p.m. put on by our young adult ministry. You don't want to miss their gifts. You see some of them up here this morning. God is multiplying and he's ministering in the hearts of our young adults. So please make a point to come out and worship with us. 
Also, our family skate night that was planned in f uh, for last week has been rescheduled for March 6th from 4 to 6. If you already bought tickets, those tickets are good. If you need to buy tickets still, you can see Christy Bates or see me, and I'll help you out with that. And we're going to have a missions video, I believe.
Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. It seems like forever since the snow we had, because you can't see any out there, but we weren't together last week because of the snow. That's, that's crazy to me. Uh, so if you would do me a favor and open your Bibles to James, we are going to start the book of James, and we're going to probably be in James for between the next uh, 14 to 18 weeks. We're going to be going through uh, the book of James. We're finally going to slow down a little bit. Uh, for the past two years, we've been kind of going through Scripture really, really fast. And, uh, and so we've decided to take things on a much slower scale. We made it all the way through the Bible in two years. And now we're going to slow way down. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time. The next season, we're going to spend in the book of James, uh, which is going to be a, a wonderful time studying together. I met with Rory, and the two of us have been uh, chopping James up and figuring out how to put those pieces together so that, uh, so that we get a, a good understanding of what James is. Uh, what I would like you to do is to remember that we still are, are going to do the podcast. Even though there wasn't anything last week uh, put online, we're going to continue to do that. Um, we are, are going to be doing the book of James in the, in the podcast. Your job is on Monday to keep reading through the book of James as many times as we can. I want you to get and understand James. We'll explain why in a little bit, why reading James over and over again is an okay way to do it. I'll, I'll, you'll see in just a, a few minutes why. But that's what we're going to be, uh, we're going to be doing, is, uh, is going through the book of James for the, for the next few months. And it should be a, a pretty good ride. So this morning we're going to introduce James. I'm going to introduce the book and kind of tell you how to read it and what it looks like and, and all of those pieces. Um, one, I have a, two announcements that we, well, one announcement I really need to make uh, this morning. We have decided uh, we're going to practice what we preach, literally. Uh, last week we preached on the need to be able to connect. And one of the reasons that we are, are struggling so bad right now is because we are isolated and separated quite a bit more than we want to be. So the elders took that challenge and came back and said, how about we move to one service and get everybody together? Since our services are not full, we can bring everybody together and still have the space that we need. Let's, let's do that. We're going to keep the live stream going. We're going to keep all of those pieces together. But we're going to move to one service uh, beginning in March. So March 6th is the first Sunday in March, and we're going to begin uh, going to one service uh, then. It will be at 10 o'clock. Um, so if there are anybody here who that impacts and you're like, I don't know how this is going to work, we want to give you some time to work, the, work it a little bit to figure out how we can make that work. Um, but also please come and talk to us so that we can uh, rearrange some things so that we can make sure that you get to still be part of it. Our goal is not to, to go to one service and then lose people in the, in the mix. Our goal is to go to one service so that we can gain the fellowship. It's, it's so funny because I'll talk to people from both services and they're like, who's that? Do they go to first service? Do they go to second service? And, and we don't meet. We need each other. And uh, as we were preaching last week, we, we desperately need to be connected. And so we're going to come all together for as long as we can for that season. Uh, we're going to come together in one service and, uh, and we're just going to enjoy one another. That's going to open up a lot of opportunities uh, for ministries. It's going to build a lot of excitement. Uh, so so let's, uh, let's look forward to that as we get closer to March so just bear with me. Again, there may be some adjustments to some schedules. There may be some adjustments for kids. There may be some adjustments for jobs. Let us know what we can do to help. And uh, like I said, we're going to continue to live stream and do all of those things. So those who are on live stream, don't panic. You get an extra hour of sleep because you can stay in. We will, the live stream will be at 10. Uh, we are not going to live stream at 9 o'clock. We will live stream at 10. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing. So we're going to be all together. There will be kids' church available. There'll be nursery available, and we'll get our uh, everyone all put together. So that's one what we're going to be doing. Before we begin and dive into God's word, let's start with a with a word of prayer. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for this congregation. 
Lord, I thank you for the healing and the care that you have for the people that are here, for your children, for the brothers and sisters that are here. God, it's so good to see Al Capito here. Lord, we praise your name. Lord, I saw him when I walked in, and God, I just praise your name for who you are, for the hands that you have on, on your children. And Lord, I pray for those who uh, are sick and recovering. Lord, I pray for uh, Bobby Matulovich. Lord, I pray that you would heal him. Lord, I pray that you would be with Nucci. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to be with all of those who are, who are sick and, uh, and are healing. God, you are an amazing God who cares so desperately for his children. Lord, I pray that you would open your word to us this morning. Lord, that we might see you uh, more clearly than we've ever seen you before. Lord, as we study James and as we look into, into the words that you, you gave this author, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would illuminate it to our hearts that we might know you more clearly. Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you for how you bless us. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, like I said, dive into the book of James. So, there's three questions you need to ask when you begin studying a book. It's very important to make sure we take Scripture in context. One dangerous thing is to grab hold of a verse and use it. I've heard many verses that are, are preached and taught, and they're not taught in the context of of the book that they're in, or even in the context of what was actually supposed to be what it was meant for. And people will take hold of a verse, they'll run with it, and it doesn't mean what they think it really means. And it becomes a very dangerous way to do that. So one incredible way to study scripture is to study an entire book at a, at a time. And that's what we're going to be doing, because it keeps everything in context, it gives us a really firm grounding, and you're going to see how much more rich you're going to see the words that are written because you get to see what God's intended words were for, for the people that he was writing to, and how that means so much to us today. And it'll add a richness to our study together. So to do that, we have to first get context of where we are in, in the time, in the place that we are, so that we know who's writing the book and what's all going on. So to begin, we have to ask the, the very first question, and that's, who wrote the book? Now this one's pretty easy. Hebrews, that one's not so easy. But this one starts off, it says, James. He's writing a letter, so he says, I am James. Very simple, very easy, until you find out most people in the biblical time were named James. And so there's a lot of different Jameses that you have to sort through, and you've got to figure out who they are. And there's two top contenders that, uh, that you would expect to be able to write this book. It's obviously somebody who, who knew Jesus well and who was with him uh, and saw him when he was preaching, because in James, more than all of the books of the Bi all of the books of the New Testament combined refer to the Sermon on the Mount. Over 20 times in five chapters, you're going to get a teaching that is, is attached to the teaching of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. And so you're going to begin to see this was somebody who was, who was close to Jesus, who was around him when, when he taught these things. And so you begin to start saying, okay, that cuts out a handful of the different Jameses that appear uh, after Jesus has been there. But there, there are three, actually there's three Jameses. There's James, son of Alphaeus. You're all like, I've never heard of him. He is uh, the other James that is in, uh, in the group of disciples that follow Jesus. We don't know anything about him. He's mentioned four times, and all four times he's mentioned in the list of disciples never to be mentioned again. We never really hear about James, son of Alphaeus. His, they, they've nicknamed him James the Lesser because there was James, the one everybody knows as James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, the ones that were fishing with, uh, with Peter and, and that whole crew. But James, the son of Alphaeus, first of all, we're all like, who's Alphaeus? It's a great name. But who, who is this? We don't know. 
So we don't know a whole lot about that James. So because we don't know a whole lot, there was not a whole lot of, of weight put on him. Chances are it was not him who wrote the book. The second uh, best contender is the James we all know. The, the James, one of the, the, he was part of the 12, but the closest three, Peter, James, and John, were the three closest that Jesus really invested in and were, were the ones that were always in the inner, inner circle of, of Jesus' uh, ministry. But we have a problem. He was martyred before, it was one of the very first martyrs during the persecution. So he was one of the first disciples to be martyred. And the book of James is written to people who have scattered because of persecution. So we begin to see that probably could not have been James because he would have been martyred ahead of this. So that leaves one very good and probably the best uh, option. And that is James, the brother of Jesus. The one who grew up with Jesus. The one who knew him incredibly well because he was his younger brother. He was Jesus' younger brother. So if you want to look, let's look real fast at Mark 6. And we're going we're gonna to look at, uh, at our first introduction to James in Scripture is found in Mark 6. It's not a very stellar uh, showing of Mark and his faith and his ability to trust, but let's, let's look at Mark 6, verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to preach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these teachings, they asked? What, uh, what's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarks, uh, remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't, he, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And so they said, this can't be Jesus. This can't be the Messiah. This can't be anybody special. How is he performing these miracles? Didn't he grow up here? James, isn't this your, your goofball, you know, older brother? It, what's going on? And you see he's rejected in his hometown. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and Jesus even says a prophet is without honor in his hometown. They didn't listen to him. Even though he had performed miracle, miraculous signs and they saw all of these amazing things, there was no awe of who he is. There was more of a, well, this, this just can't be. And we see that with James. And, and later on, we see James actually, Jesus does some, uh, some miraculous things and he says, well, why don't you go and take that to Jerusalem where, you know, where you, you don't want to hide what you're doing. You want to get out there and show everybody what you're doing. Literally what James was doing was sending Jesus to go either prove it or just be killed or proved wrong and to leave in shame. So James did not instantly start off by totally believing that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. Now flip back to the book of James. And here we find him. His opening starts off by saying, James. He's saying who he is, but we would expect him to say what? James, the brother of Jesus. Give himself some authority, right? This is the James that later on becomes the pastor, for lack of a better word, the pastor of the very first church in Jerusalem. This is the James who is what they call James the Just. He is so wise and so powerful and strong and, and so firm in the word that he is the, the pastor, the lead apostle in the church in Jerusalem. And so I want you to understand that the person writing here is, has a very pastoral heart. He cares for his people. And so you have James. And listen to how he describes himself. 
He doesn't say James, the son of the son of uh, uh, the the brother of Jesus. He doesn't say James, the the head pastor of the the mega church in Jerusalem. He says no, James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So James starts off this passage as the younger brother, saying, "I am James." the servant of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to stop there for a minute and tear that apart. First of all, in Greek there is no what's called definite articles, which means like the. So you literally can read this as, uh, I'm a servant of God, Jesus Christ. So, the, that it's not just the and, and it's, it, you can run this all together, that he is calling Jesus God. He is putting him, he's putting Jesus on the same level of God, whether or not you look at it that way. You look where he says, I am a servant of God and of Jesus Christ. He is putting Christ in such an amazing authority over him. He's putting his, his big brother in the this, in this spot above him. Now, we also have to look at the word servant. The word servant here is not a great translation. We translate it servant because uh, the word that it could be, should be translated to has a lot more uh, bad connotations to it. But the word is actually slave. It's dolos, which means somebody who is not just uh, a servant, somebody sold into servanthood. No, this is someone who was born into slavery. This is the, the lowest of the low in the, in the home. This is somebody who was born into slavery, who does not have their own freedom and never has. This is the one who is a slave to his brother. Do you see the humility that James starts off this letter with? He starts off, he doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to prove who he is in any way, shape, or form. He starts off by saying, listen, I need you to understand who Jesus is. He takes his power and his authority as the head pastor of Jerusalem and says, I am nothing compared to who he is. I am his slave. I am born to him. I am owned by him. The humility that he has looking at Christ this way. The next word we have to look at is Lord. We read that because we hear it so often and we sing it and we talk about the Lord and all these things and we just automatically think God. But what does the word Lord mean? It means master. It means someone who has complete authority over and when you call someone Lord, you would, you would call someone Lord who is, uh, that you're trying to show as respect to a, to a king who is over you. You would say, my Lord, I am sorry. You know, or my Lord, would you please allow this to happen? It's a very humbling term, but it is a term that he gives Jesus. And not only that, but it's the word used with the capital L, Lord. Lord which is the king of kings, the master of masters, the one who has complete authority over someone else. It is the sovereign one. And so what he is saying here is he's saying, James, I am James, a slave to the master. God has complete authority in my life. 100% sovereignty in my life. And Jesus Christ is Lord, the sovereign one over my life. Now this is the key part of James. If we don't get this part, we don't understand what the rest of James is all about. James has 54 imperatives, or 54 kind of commands, and this is how you shall live type phrases. 54. So the second question we have to ask is not just who wrote the book, but how did they write it? What is the purpose for how they wrote this book? 
So what type of writing is it? We look at it and it's called an epistle. It's called a letter. But as you've read through James, if you read and did your homework this week and you read through James, you realize this is not a letter like the other epistles. This is more like Proverbs. This is actually considered wisdom literature. It's, it's called an epistle, it's called a letter, but when we, when we kind of look at it and figure out how we're supposed to read it, you have to understand that this is not just a letter, this is, a, this is like the book of Proverbs. It's wisdom literature. It's quick, short, this is what I need you to do. This is a pastor And we're going to explain in just a second, writing to his people and saying, this is how you should live. It's like Proverbs where the father is writing to his son and says, listen, gain wisdom, do these things and it will end well for you. This is how you should live. So you can either look at James and say, James, this book is a fantastic book to learn how to live a great moral life. How not to have favoritism. How to tame your tongue. How to, how to not fall for the deceitfulness of wealth. We can look at this and we can find a new way of living and a good moral way to go. But that's not why the book of James was written. That's why he starts by saying, no, you have to understand, when the Lord is the Lord of your life, when the master is the master of your life, this is what your life looks like. It's not just to try to curry favor with a God so that he gives you good things. No, he's not. He starts off by saying, this is not just a God. This is my master. This is one who has my life. I'm not going to try to do things just to please him, to get things from him. No, I serve him because I am his. I am his. And so when he is talking that way, he's saying because you are his, because of the lordship of Jesus Christ, that phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, is master of all, king of all kings. His name is Jesus. He is the Messiah. Christ is not his last name, for those of you who didn't know that. It's not Jesus Christ. It wasn't like Joseph's last name was Christ. Christ literally means Messiah. It is his, uh, his title. This is the Messiah. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. And then he puts in front of that, Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the key to understanding James, is that we need to keep that part in mind, that God is Lord of my life. If not, a lot of this stuff is just good moral living. And we want so much more than just good moral living. If God is the the one who reigns over your life, this is how you will change. Because He is Lord. It'll make much more sense as we go. Because you're going to hear in James, he says, why, do you, why are there quarrels and fights among you? It's because Jesus isn't Lord of your life. He says, why do you not have? Well, because you don't ask, because he is not Lord of your life. So he puts in the letter in the very beginning, we just blow past this as a greeting. But he's giving you the key to to James. He's giving you the key to the whole rest of the book by saying, when the Lord is the Lord of your life, this is what it looks like. And so we need to keep our eyes firmly on that. And I have to ask you an incredibly difficult question. Is Jesus the Messiah Lord in your life? Is he the one who has sovereignty over your life? That's one thing we struggle with, is giving up our sovereignty. Giving up our ability to care and take care of ourselves and have authority over me. How many times have you heard, especially recently, you can't tell me what to do. I am the one who needs to make these choices. I am the one who needs to care for myself. I am the one who needs to make those decisions. Where that's somewhat true, 
it misses the whole boat. It's the Lord. He is the one who lords over my life. He is the one who is sovereign over all things. And when we lose sight of the sovereignty of God, then this book just becomes a book of things I need to do. More things to work on and to, to, to try to add to my life. No, this is all what happens when the Lord is in the place He belongs in your life and He is sovereign. We're going to talk about where He says, you know what, we say to ourselves, I'm going to go to this, this place and I'm going to go do this. And He says, well, if God doesn't want you to go there, you're not going. So when, when, he, when you say, I'm going to go, add to it, Lord willing. Because he is the one who is sovereign. It's not about your plan, it's about his. But that part doesn't make any real sense to us other than I'm just going to put Lord willing in front of everything. But his whole point is, if God is Lord of your life, if there is the Lord Jesus Christ, then, then yeah, Lord willing, I'll be there. And I mean, I will follow wherever his will is. Someone asked me this morning, is there Bible study tomorrow morning? Yes, we have Bible study. That's my plan. But how many times has God changed that plan? We could have 12 feet of snow. It's actually not a far-fetched thing. We could have an outbreak of something else. We could have, we don't know because we are not sovereign. He is. Now, that brings up a very interesting point. We've all heard the verse that says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. What? Jesus Christ is Lord. That's not just a phrase. It's not just, oh, he's going to force everyone. No, everyone's going to sit down and, and kneel down on one knee. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is sovereign. It's his plan. It's who he is. James is just telling you what that looks like if you do that on this side of glory. And my prayer is that every one of our knees here begin to bow in authority to Jesus Christ. That He is Lord in your life. Let me ask you, what areas in your life are you sovereign and God is not? What area of your life will you not turn over to Him? For many of us, it's our finances. And you begin to hear that same phrase as we are looking at this beginning part of James. You hear that same phrase where it says, you cannot serve two masters. You will either love one and hate the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon or money or whatever we view as our source of life. He is. You can't serve two masters. And that's what James is saying here. Let me read you the whole beginning. The whole greeting says this. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. So what we have in just the first half of the first sentence is a declaration of the lordship of Jesus Christ. And James is saying, listen, I need to tell you where I'm writing from. I'm writing not from a place of authority on my own. I'm not writing from a place of authority because of where and who I was born and, and, and slept in a bunk with. I am telling you where my authority comes from is from Jesus Christ because He is the one who is sovereign. I am just a slave and I will tell you, yes, you can serve any master you want, but you can only serve one and I have chosen my brother, Jesus Christ. That's what James has put in a huge mouthful into a tiny little phrase. He says, I have chosen to serve him and him alone. And then he says to the 12 tribes, which we know that means to those who are Jewish, 
scattered among the nations. So he is writing to Jewish Christians who had once been part of his church in Jerusalem, but because of persecution, got out of the city and left so that they would not be martyred like James. And it's one of the most amazing things. Because of that, the word of God began to spread. And it was, we used to, we think that it was Paul who would go in and he would plant these churches. But God put the seeds in the soil by sending all of these people all throughout the nations. That God had a plan, and that persecution that came that cost James the son of thunder, James the, the, the son of Zebedee, that cost his life, spread the word all over the place, ready for somebody like Paul to come in and share the gospel and gather the flock and begin to plant churches in places like Ephesus and Corinthia and in Corinth and all of those places, Philippi. And so you begin to see this is God's plan and his work and they are scattered but as the pastor is writing to his people he's saying listen I need to explain to you how to live because you're landing in all of these places and you're going to have pressure from the outside to to change and to not be this let me explain to you what it looks like when you follow the lordship of Jesus Christ when your knee bows to him this is who you become And that is what the book of James is all about. That's what we're going to be studying as we go through. But we get nowhere. If you're reading the book of James and Jesus Christ is not Lord of your life, you get nothing from it. If you are not reading each section and saying Jesus Christ is Lord, so fill in the blank then you totally miss the whole point. It'll just be, well, it's good to be this kind of person. It's good not to judge others. It's good not to have favoritism to people. It's good to treat everyone equal. Okay, that's good. But it's so much more rich when we begin to understand that it's because Jesus Christ is Lord. Then this, then this is how I should be. And so 54 times... He's going to tell you in five book, in five uh, chapters, literally, I think it's like five pages in my Bible. In five pages, 54 times, he's going to tell you, give you an imperative of how things are supposed to be and how we are supposed to live because Jesus Christ is Lord. So my challenge to you this week is, is Jesus Christ Lord? Many, many it says in Scripture, will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. And I will look at them and say, I never knew you. Do you know him as your Lord? Do you know him as Lord of your life? Not just know about him. Not just know the stories. Not just really enjoy the sermons. That's what happens to the book of James. People enjoy James because they look at it as a really good sermon that doesn't have to affect their lives. But we see from the get-go, James is all about your life is going to change because of Jesus Christ. Is he Lord of your life? We can't pretend and say, I I am sovereign and I live a life of sovereignty in and of myself, developing my whole kingdom, and and then when I see him, I will come to him and say, Lord, I knew you. I went to Trinity. And he'll say, but you never, you were never about my kingdom. It was always about yours. That part, that verse that says, seek first the kingdom of God, it doesn't mean when it's all over. Seek first Him. Are you seeking Him above all things? And I know right now there's a lot of other things that are going through your mind that are in the way where you're saying, but but it's not fair. If if this had been in my life, then then I I would be able to do that better. Wrong. That's what you are worshiping and serving. 
Some of you are sitting there saying, if this hadn't been in my life, then, then I, I, could, I could follow his kingdom, but I have to put my guard up. No, you are wrong. That's the master you're serving. You have to understand there's so many things that we make master of our lives. What is mastering you right now? What is it that you're thinking about? What is it that you're worried about? What is it that that gives you anxiety and fear? That is what has lordship in your life. You may be sitting there saying, I don't even like it. I, I don't like those things. But if they are the first thing on your mind, That is what has the lordship of your life. But James starts off by saying, the first thing on my mind is that he is my master. And because he is my master, then it puts into perspective all of the things that I am going through. All of the hard things, all of the good things, they all get put into proper perspective and I can see, I can can go through anything. The next next verse is going to be this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. Why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Because it's not all about your trials. It's not all about your comfort. It's not all about your discomfort. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is sovereign. If there's anything you walk away today, it's to have that priority in place. And we're going to keep going over that time and time again. 54 times through James. No, we're not going to take 54 weeks and go through James. I know a lot of you are like, no, no. We're going to go through this and we're going to see what happens when the Lord is the Lord of your life. But you have to make him Lord of your life. So I do ask you, have you ever asked Jesus to begin a relationship with you and to become the Lord of your life? It says he stands at the door and knocks. You have to open the door. You can't say, well, I heard him knock. That's good. No. You've got to open. You've got to begin that relationship with him. You've got to honestly be able to say, Lord, you're Lord of my life. Jesus, because of what we're going to celebrate today, you get to be sovereign. It is you. Your will be done in my life. You be sovereign. For those of us who've who've begun that relationship, it is so easy to get distracted and put the lordship of Jesus down, isn't it? We pick him up every once in a while when we need him and we brush him off and we dust him off and we blow the dust off of him and we say, yeah, I know we haven't talked in a while, Jesus, but, but I need your lordship now. The point of James is you need his lordship now. It doesn't matter what is going on in your life. He is Lord. So whether you need the Lord to heal, whether you need the Lord to give wisdom, whether you need the Lord to walk with you, He is the one who is sovereign. The point is, you just need the Lord. Let's pray. Our God and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this book of James. I thank you for the ability to to see you for who you truly are this morning. That you are the master of our lives. Rest is not. Being comfortable is not Lord of our life. The discomfort that we feel now because of whatever it is that's weighing on us, that is not the master we serve. Jesus, help us to serve you as our Lord, our sovereign one, that our lives are yours. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I could have the elders come forward. If you're at home, you have a few seconds to jump up, grab some type of substitute for a cracker and grape juice. And we have an opportunity to celebrate communion.
this morning. And I hope communion has a bit of a, of a rich meaning to you this morning. This is an opportunity to come together. And at the very end, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Can you imagine what communion meant to James? The reminder of the meals that he had with Jesus growing up. The reminder of the time that he took for granted sitting next to his master. The time out in the yard playing together. Being true friends. As we come and we have an opportunity to have communion, it represents what Jesus Christ did on the cross. His body broken for us and his blood spilled for the forgiveness of our sins that we might be free. But you need to understand that your Lord is the one who died for you. He died to purchase you. It says when Jesus Christ raised from the dead, he went to the disciples, to the apostles, and then he went to James. I wonder if that's the day James got it. That James became born into slavery to Jesus Christ. Born into a relationship truly with not just an earthly brother, but a heavenly father. And so that's what we celebrate this morning as we pass the, the elements around. Now remember, the elements, because of COVID, are wrapped up. Take off the very top part first. It's just a piece of cellophane. Don't pull the plastic part or else you'll get instant juice. Mm -hmm. But we're going to do this together because of who he is. Let's pray. Father, we come before your table. As you asked us to do, as you commanded us to do, as you so lovingly as a master told us we, we need to, to remember you. And Lord, in this we see that the things you command us to do are not harsh or heavy. They're good. So as we come before your, your table and we eat with you and we commune with one another and before your throne, remind us of what Jesus Christ has done. Father, I pray if there's anybody here who has fooled themselves into thinking that you are Lord of their lives, but they haven't given their life to you, Lord, I pray that you would knock really hard on the door of their heart today. That they might hear you. That they might open the door and welcome you. And Lord, that they might begin an incredible relationship with you. Lord, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the suffering that it took to buy our freedom. To buy us to be in relationship with you. I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
the night he was going to be betrayed. That to me is the shocking part. He didn't do this when it was all kind and good and everything was going to turn out okay. He did this the night he knew he was going to be betrayed. The night he knew he was going to be sitting in the garden praying and asking God to remove this cup from him. Let the will be done because God was Lord for him. He submitted to the authority of God and what God wanted. He said, your will be done. So Jesus said on the night he was going to be betrayed, this is my body broken for you. Let's do this in remembrance of him. That same night, he took the wine. And as he was pouring it out, he didn't pour it on the floor. He didn't pour it. He poured it into each of their cups. He poured it in that they might be able to take of it, that they might be full. And as he poured out the wine, he said, this is my blood poured out for you. We always picture just kind of him sitting there with the pitcher pouring it out onto the floor, but no, he was pouring it into a cup for them to take. This is his blood for us to take, the forgiveness of sins for us to accept. Let's do this in remembrance of him. Our gracious God and Amazing Father, Savior and Lord, Master, Sovereign One over our lives. We thank you for giving your life that we might have life. May our lives show gratitude. May we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. You alone are worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand with me as we close with a song. space between where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone there'll be another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the seas should I ever need reminders of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore praise the Lord 
Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding what power set me free? There is a grave that holds nobody. Now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, I can see the light in the darkness. As the darkness bows to him, I can hear the roar in the heavens. As the space between wears thin, I can feel the ground shake beneath us. As the prison walls cave in, and nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between west and i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between us There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. No, I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding, how good you've been to me? the joy from every battle cause I know that's where you'll be there'll be another in the fire standing next to me there'll be another in the waters holding back the sea should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me the joy from every battle because I know that's where you'll be I count the joy from every battle because I know that's where you'll be I count that joy from every battle because I know that's where you'll be book of James. James, the brother of Jesus, who was the, the pastor of the Jerusalem church, and he's writing to his people who are scattered because he cares and he loves them. 
What is the main key? Jesus Christ is Lord. We don't get that. We don't get the rest of this. Jesus Christ is Lord. Know that this is why that book was written. It's not written as a letter, as a normal letter letter was written. It was written as wisdom imparted from a pastor to his people, a father to his sons, to his children, to say, listen, this is how you should live. Because, repeat after me, Jesus Christ is Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, there is no other. There is no other name that we could turn to. There is no other sacrifice for our sins. It is you and it is you alone. Be Lord of our lives. Have sovereignty over it all. Take our lives, Lord, and let them be an offering to you. God, you are so good to your people. Thank you for buying us with the blood of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Enjoy. Have a great week.